ElectroCast. Hold music. You want to avoid it, and so do your customers. So say goodbye to hold music and hello to faster, smarter support with Salesforce. Make service more personal and agents more productive using built-in trusted AI. Then watch costs and wait times drop and satisfaction soar. Support customers in a whole new way with Service GPT. Learn how at salesforce.com slash service GPT. Welcome to the Nature Backed Podcast, where we are talking with investors and entrepreneurs about climate change and the green economy. My name is Tarma Virki, and my guest today is Matt Ward. Hey there, I'm Merit. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Single Earth, and we are building a nature-backed currency to empower you to fight against climate change and biodiversity loss. Sign up at Single Earth and be among the first to switch to a truly sustainable, nature-based economy. And don't forget to join the discussion around climate change and biodiversity loss on our Discord channel. Enjoy the show. Welcome, Matt, to uh, Nature Backed. Thank you for having me, Tom. I'm excited to come on. Uh, Tell us a few words, what is Ward VC? At some point, uh, it started to pop into my LinkedIn box and uh, I got interested to hear more about it. So my ego is not big enough to call it Ward VC. It's actually Forward VC. We invest in companies that move the world forward and just the number forward.vc. And what we are, we're an early stage climate syndicate. So we invest in pre-seed and seed climate companies that are really transforming, disrupting, and saving the world. Uh, we do that across Europe, North America, and Israel. We've got around 180 LPs, and there may be some exciting iterations coming that involve acceleration and speed, but I can't say more than that. The uh, 180 LPs, how many companies you've invested to, uh, through this new vehicle already? So we're pretty new, actually. We I started this initiative about a year ago after having been in the startups and e-commerce space for quite a while. And I was tired of working with startups on strategy growth product for D2C and B2B SaaS companies, just more pointless SHIT, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I decided, God, I want to do something that truly matters. That's when I started Forward VC. So fast forward to today, connected with a thousand plus funds, accelerators, incubators, built up the startup tank, which is our climate investor pitch show. Think Shark Tank, Dragon's Den, Hode de Lowen, depending on where you're calling in from. We bring on two to three uh, climate investors, six climate companies. But we haven't done that many deals to date. And the biggest issue that we've had so far is... For at least the six, first six to nine months, we just didn't have enough LPs. You've got to have enough capital to put into companies. So most of the best companies that we were seeing, we were just sending other places to other investors and saying, hey, we just want to be helpful, knowing that maybe karma comes back. We've done we've done three deals to date so far. So uh, a pretty disruptive battery tech company out of Israel, a mushroom company that eats uh, petrochemical plastic and garbage and turns it into new raw material. And another company that's replacing uh, plastics with plants. Pretty pretty cool stuff. I've, I'm an advisor for a handful of the other companies that we didn't have kind of enough cash or firepower to invest on. And the big the biggest problem that I have with a syndicate is it's like a bit like herding cats to cat food. So we have all of these great investments we want to do, but they're all opt-in investments from our investors. So if you can put two and two together, the biggest problem with a syndicate is not having the dedicated funds we're moving in the direction of making things a little bit more dedicated so we can pull the trigger on the companies we're excited about, mm. if you catch my drift. I do. Uh, and uh, as I understand, you're not really willing to speak in detail about that yet. Yeah, not not yet. It's not something I can legally talk oh, about yet. Okay, okay. so we're we, not uh, speaking we're about excited. it. We're, we're pretty excited about it. <laughs> that sounds sounds really interesting. Uh, but th- there's been a bunch of the um, bunch of the funds popping up in the sector over the last couple of years. We've seen, you know, across Europe, we've seen a, a lot of these like 100 to 150 million funds for climate investments. Um, at the same time, the world around us has um, a little bit, um, how would I say, collapsed. Um, how these two things go together? Does it mean that, you know, for a, for an early stage investment scene, it's actually better because there's maybe less competition or more money or how, how does that equation work? So 
But if you look at what the what the future looks like in the next five to twenty five years, there's probably going to be five to twenty five trillion that could put into climate tech, and we basically have to revamp the entire infrastructure and economy of the world. And to do that, it's going to take a ton of time, money, effort, technology, um, genius, etc. The big problem is as governments start to deploy capital and start to put carbon credits, start to really push behind that, as LPs start to divest out of fossil fuels and into the things that actually save our world as more investors like like you and me or people that want to have their money do more get into the space there's a ton of money coming in but there is absolutely no way to write or put five trillion dollars into pre-seed and seed stage climate companies though the people that are coming in they want to write big checks 50 100 million dollar checks and th- that because it's easier and because you get big management fees for doing that, which means there's a ton of capital there at the later stages. But at the earlier stages, there is a major crunch. So if you can help the company survive the next three to five years, there's almost unlimited dumb money to grow and scale and become the mega mega kind of unicorn, decacorn, et cetera, of tomorrow that define the economy and the world. But you need to get to that point. There's definitely a crunch in the early stage. What that crunch means is the companies... There's a lot of companies that have been funded that probably shouldn't have, but there's also now it's much harder to get funded for early stage companies. So for us as investors, that makes things incredibly interesting because valuations are starting to come back to reality. They're no longer COVID inflated and uh, Fed printing money inflated. Mm -hmm. So you can have much better returns without having to have as massive of outcomes. For companies, it's a little bit harder because it is... I'm telling companies, look, take as much money you can at pretty much whatever terms you can, because otherwise you're probably going to die because that's just kind of the situation. That's where we're, that's where we operate with forward VC and our syndicate and the things we're thinking about doing about speeding up companies. And that's really, I've spent the last year and I can honestly say probably working harder than anyone else on the networking side of things. So thousands of funds, incubators, accelerators, corporates, CVCs. And that's the model that we have is we invest in the top companies, the ones that are doing really disruptive things that we can then give steroids to and unlock our network, make the connections to the corporates, get them pilots, get them customers, get them traction, uh, find their funding for this round, the next round, further rounds, and help them kind of step through that they, oh, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell. The the dip, the the, the dip is going to be real painful here for climate companies and for startups in general. But if they can get across that dip, they become the they become the champions of tomorrow. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, is there any kind of good tips to how to manage that? Um, you know, getting through the dip. I would say, stop spending money on anything you don't need to be spending money on. And, that, and that's yesterday. So uh, a lot of the excess that goes into startups and f- especially funded startups, all of that needs to be gone as of quite a while ago. You probably need to cut back on the salaries. You probably need to talk to teammates and employees about taking more equity and less cash. You really need to focus above everything else on clients and traction. Fundraising, take as much money as you can. But if you have clients out there and you can get to that profitability or close to profitability status, you don't need money anymore. And once you're your default alive, once you're profitable, you can just keep going. So that's that's what I say to companies is go out there, find those customers, do 20, 50, 100 just straight up cold outreaches. That's part of a program we may be designing, but there's a lot of ways that you can you can do things like that to get that traction and to get across the the dip, so to speak. The other thing I would say is, again, don't worry too much about valuation. Don't worry too much about dilution. Think about how many rounds you're going to have to do with your uh, company. How much VC capital are you actually going to take? Is it such a big deal to do 30, 40% dilution if you're only going to need one other VC round for the rest of the company's lifetime? We The Exxon deal that we did, they took a larger dilution just because they wanted to get the capital in now and they won't need the capital soon with what's happening business traction wise. The other thing I would look at as well is non-dilutive funding. So what can you do to get more funding for your company and extend that runway? That comes down to either revenue-based or uh, contract-based financing. We've got a we've got a pretty solid guide on our website that 
uh, founders can look at just at forward.vc. You'll find it there mm. on our non-dilutive funding or mm. grants. So getting grant funding could be a, a great way to extend the runway as well. And that would be that would be kind of the the primary things that I would kind of point to or uh, highlight on for companies that are trying to survive the who knows how long recession that's coming our way. Mm. The uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of the you, you, the three companies you've been you you got kind of have invested in as a syndicate uh, mushrooms. Uh, Pla- two not of them, the exciting, two, not the exciting kind, but yeah. still exciting. <laughs> <laughs> two, two of them were plastics. In, plastics involved. Is plastic something which we see a lot of uh, kind of activities in? Is it something people are working on? Well, we need to decarbonize our entire economy and turn your head left and right. How many objects do you see? I bet you at least half of them have plastic in there. And there's just so plastic is 5% of global emissions and reducing that is a major play. So MicroCycle doesn't only do plastic. Basically, they're eating the waste from the construction and demolition industry, things like rubber, uh, gypsum, shingles, etc. Anything that has some type of petrochemical base, they can take those toxins out. The mushrooms eat that and then create new raw material in the form of calcium carbonate replacements. They think they can eventually do a kind of wood-based fillers as well. So you have the circularness of knocking down the building and uses in the pieces you just knocked down to build the next building. But plastic is, there's a lot happening in the plastic space, both on the durable plastic side, like with applied bioplastics, where they're replacing 30 to 40% of the plastic in plastic with ground up plant-based fibers. And on the, on the non-durable plastic, the single use why in God's name did they give me uh, a sealed bag to hold the strawberries in? Or why is this? Why do I have a fork that I have to throw out after it isn't biodegradable? All that stuff drives me nuts, but it drives other people nuts too. And luckily, there's finally a, more of a push towards getting rid of some of that or improving some of that. So I'm I'm pretty excited about that. And a, a lot of people are. The biggest challenge, of course, is can they get something that becomes cost competitive? Because right now we don't take we don't take kind of planet ruining into account for for unit economics. So feel free to ruin the planet as long as you're profitable. As as there starts to be more carbon credits or carbon taxes that come into play, that will hopefully change. But even then, I think you've got to be able to get to a real business without just having to rely on subsidies or having to rely on on that so that's uh that's kind of how i advise i advise founders is if we can get this to a real business that really makes money then we mm. can make this into a business that really really makes money once we have the once we have the right incentives in place yeah jumping a little bit back and forth the free and free to five year crunch or dip period you were earlier talking about uh when probably the kind of climate startups have grown into the scale where they can raise a lot of money and grow faster maybe with a new fuel again. Um, Looking at the other side of the equation, not at the economy, but at the climate, you know, three to five year dip sounds like um, relatively bad when looking at the speed of climate change and the acceleration of the climate change. I would agree how I how I think about this is everyone has different metrics for what they're what they're trying to achieve when it comes to fighting climate change or what we should be doing. And one thing that I've noticed that's incredibly not helpful is being an idealist or an extremist. So when when vegans kind of attack the world for not being vegan enough, I don't think you're helping convert other people to veganism or vegetarianism or flexitarianism. It just it doesn't work. It turns people off. And if the world's at a certain point right now, if we're able to reduce, like I had a, I had a pretty good debate with uh, another investor. Then uh, it was about a company that reduces uh, cow burps. So cow burps, methane, methane is something like 33, 32 times worse than CO2 in the atmosphere. And this reduces a pretty darn large percentage of cows burps, which is methane, which is the biggest driver of methane in the world. Well, 
in my opinion, that's an incredible investment from a climate tech perspective because it buys us more time to figure out the solutions that we need. The other person's perspective was that, but that also kind of perpetuates animal agriculture, which is the problem we're trying to solve. So how I view things from forward VC's perspective is, is this making the world proportionally better? So for every unit, for every service, for every new customer, et cetera, does the world become proportionally better? If the answer is yes, that is a climate company and we would be, uh, we would be interested and excited. I don't need to see set carbon reduction numbers, set plastic reduction numbers, because especially at the early stages, first of all, all the numbers are made up anyways. B, have you ever met a startup that didn't pivot? And C, the founders don't really have the time to do that much. And I certainly don't have the time to do that much when it comes to the the life cycle assessments. Show me that when this product, et cetera, is compared to a, a different product that it's five, 10, 50% better. And obviously that is also true as it scales. Mm, okay. It's back of the envelope math. Mm, of course, early, sta mm -hmm. early stage, it makes all the sense. Ex exactly. So. I, will we will we stop climate change? No. Will we fight climate change and try to make the best of worlds that we can and still have something livable? Yes. And I am someone who suffers enough from cynicism and negativity. My goal with this is I'm going to make as big of a dent as I can. Whether that is enough or not, I don't know but I'm going to aim towards it being enough and being positive on a, on a climate and a, and a world perspective, because if, okay, I like, me I love metaphors. If you're 250 pounds and have to lose weight and you have to be perfect tomorrow, it's nearly impossible. But if you have to be almost perfect and do the best you can, and sometimes something happens, well, then you have a chance to succeed. And that's how I view this. Let's assume we can do it as long as we play together and we, we have the right goals in place. Mm -hmm. And I think if uh, there is enough people who are targeting to have a dent, then they can actually, you know, have a glow on a global scale impact on the on the current situation. Because reading the, you know, now with the IPCC meeting again starting as we record this, the, all, all of the latest reports are out uh, showing that, you know, we can't do much, basically. And, uh, you know, the cynicism is uh, very much uh, something I, you know, relate here with. Uh, I mean, I've been in media for 20 plus years. If you're not a cynical person, you can't be in the media for many years. Mm -hmm. It, does, it just doesn't work. Now. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work at all. <laughs> no, I, I, I get that. I... I think I think that climate investing and the climate in general is the biggest opportunity we've ever had ever because either we pull it off and succeed or pretty much we all effing die and go to war and the world goes to absolute SHIT. So what would you rather bet on? Would you rather bet on humanity being creative and coming up with solutions and doing the hard thing? Or would you rather bet against humanity? And I think the I think the positivity uh, I think the positivity uh, uh, it's worthwhile. I, I, I'm thinking in German now. Sorry, it's uh, <laughs> I think that's a better option here. It's definitely a better option. At the same time, of course, if uh, if you want to win money, maybe betting against the positivity might have a better odds of uh, being. <laughs> ah, definitely. But it's like the people the. I, I remember I, I, I did a podcast interview one time with uh, Douglas Rushkoff, and he's a big speaker, thought leader, et cetera, yada, yada. And he, he was saying it made him just he was so pissed. He was getting invited to these kind of billionaire conference uh, get together where they were discussing, OK, New Zealand or um, uh, the, the, or what was the other place? I don't remember. Where do we build a, where do we build our kind of world ending bunker? Because the people that were the ones that were creating the problem were too much of cowards to actually try to fix it. And yes, you can get incredibly successful and rich by betting against the world. 
But if you're the person who's shorting Tesla or shorting world positive things, do you really want to live in that world where you win? Do you really want to live in the world where, um, what's the, what's the term? Um, P- P- Peter Thiel, uh, what a libertarianism. Do you really want to live in the, the libertarianism ideal? Because we've a never experienced that. B, the, the folks that have experienced the closest to that know that it's a shithole. And C, what it really ends up is bulletproofing your Teslas and kind of trying to survive the hordes uh, because you've been so successful and the rest of the world is, has gone to hell in a handbasket. My, uh, money, money is a means to an end, not the, the, the end. Mm, true. Very true. Um, looking uh, forward into the uh, new year, what's your... I mean, we should not speak about uh, what you cannot legally speak about, but uh, what's uh, your kind of the next year's big things to work on or targets or you want to reach next year? So my goal is to work with one or two awesome companies a month and help them really accelerate where they're where they're going and where they're growing, Ra- raise their rounds, get to next stage, bring on customers, grow, scale, and become successful and to take that to kind of higher heights with the the strategies and systems that I've built and put in place in the past. My background is as a serial entrepreneur, a salesperson, a growth hacker, and I, I bring that to work for the companies that we invest in via the syndicate or if there were something else that we were investing via. And we and I want to make more climate companies successful in the fastest means possible, because as we've said here, there is a lot of urgency at, and at, and at the same time, a lot of climate companies that you see are incredible. They're innovative. They've got the technology to save the world. It's perfect, but it's two guys or two girls out of a laboratory that don't know how to speak with humans or how to sell, or they think the technology itself is enough. And I could tell you I've invented a time machine. It's in my basement. But unfortunately, I'm not a billionaire because I haven't figured out how to sell it. So that's where we come in and we help companies. We connect them with corporates. We connect them with customers. We get them funding people, et cetera, because it takes a team to to build a to build a startup. It takes a village to to raise something great. And that's kind of what I'm excited about for the future is how we can do that in a in an evergreen type style of focusing on long-term growth and not just short-term outcomes. Mm. But how do you swap then? You said a couple of companies per month. Uh, do you have the November companies you're working now and the December companies uh, then? So I like I like the model of, hmm, let's just say hypothetically, like a 10 week program I find to be pretty ideal for getting customers, getting traction, networking, scaling things up, perfecting a pitch, meeting investors, raising funding, et cetera. Now, if you wanted to be like a coach on entrepreneur funding acceleration type coach, you could probably do one or two companies a month over 10 weeks. So you're working with what, two to six companies at a time kind of thing. Mm. I could certainly see people thinking like that as a good model versus this, let's do large cohorts of super impersonal and uh, unpersonal. I can't think, I can't think right now, whatever the, whatever the correct English word for that is. Yeah, we'll yeah, I understand. I, uh, I think the audience will understand also. The, yeah. The, uh, you can keep things. I, I, I like to keep things close and intimate because that's where I think the big, the big value add is, is when you have somebody who's literally your partner in crime. Absolutely. Absolutely. The also have, having been that seen that, uh, you know, in early stage investors who are hands on and helping the companies to grow compared to the early stage investors who are not hands on. There's a ma- massive difference there. And everybody, everybody kind of says their value add or they're helpful or et cetera. Oh, yeah, they and they're do. founder friendly. Yeah. Because those are all the big buzzwords. And then you look behind the mirror and the the emperor has no clothes. That's that's what I would say I would be, would be most keen on. So after after having done this and built this is what founders say about working together. And it's pretty much, yeah, they're willing to take better and lower valuations from us and from me. 
because I'm a hustler <laughs> and I'm willing to bust my ass to make sure they win. I hope we're, I'm allowed to say ass. I'm not sure. I surely are. Come on. Very good. Very. You, you know, you never know with iTunes and all of that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't that's, that. I, that's, that's me. That's me. I'm kind of, we, I don't, we, I don't sugarcoat it. Yeah. We speak straight here in Estonia always. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You're in Estonia much, much better, but, uh, Mm -hmm, but our listeners, cool. of course, everywhere. Uh, of, of course, you've got a uh, the, the podcast is awesome. You've done a great job with building it, by the way. Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, let's uh, stop it here uh, and uh, continue the discussion online. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And quick shout out to the listeners. If you guys are in this space looking for funding, We've got a database. So those thousands that I've reached out to, if you go to forwardvc.com, sorry, sorry forward.vc slash VC database. So the number forward, like we invest in companies that move the world forward, dot VC slash VC database, 750 funds, incubators, accelerators, CVCs. You can filter by stage, sector, geography, check size to find your ideal investor. We've got some We've got some pretty cool uh, climate Slack communities now for founders and another one for investors, so they don't become overly pitchy. And some other awesome resources on the site, just forward.vc. If you're looking for funding and you want to pitch, we've got our little Shark Tank Dragon's Den of the Startup Tank, and that's just the startuptank.com. And we do that twice a month. And thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, Tarmo. Yeah, I've I've looked at through the through the database, uh, downloaded the spreadsheet, and looked at it. And do, do add do add me to the climate entrepreneur community. I, I don't want to be too pitchy for the investors. Mm -hmm, definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, very cool. Well, thanks for having me on, and thanks for everybody's time. Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Cheers, folks. Join us again for the next episode. Thank you for listening. If you like the show, please give us a good rating and leave the feedback in your podcast player so others will find it too. We will be back next week. Turn on to Nature Backed Podcast. So we love the curse of the lake house. We, we love, love the, the curse. Welcome to the curse of the lake house. I am not a witch. Really well written. Keeps you guessing. I really like the ending. Peter, otters mate for life too. Otters find the otter they belong with and they mate for life too. The curse of the lake house. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Electric acid. Hey, how's it going? You should check out Worship 95, Creating Heaven on Earth, music to bring you into God's presence and remind you of his promises. Listen on the Autolus app or online at autolus.com forward slash worship 95. Electric acid.